the title here, um, you can read for yourself, and I'll eventually get back to this, um, but if you'd like to uh, just humour me for a moment, I'm going to start with uh, a bit of Hollywood, and if you can read that up there, the title of this, uh, The Perfect Storm, and actually Michael from Syngenta used that term a little earlier, so I'd like to just you know, play along with his analogy for a moment. So uh, many folks have probably seen this film, I, I, I watched it a couple of Saturdays ago, and I'm not better to watch, it's quite an old film, but briefly the story is, you know, George Clooney, he's the skipper of a, a New England sword fishing boat, and he's not doing very well, he's not getting his fish in, and uh, one day, despite really bad uh, weather warnings, he decides, I'm going off, I'm going to get some fish. Uh, so off, off he heads with his, his crew, and he, he heads off to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the fishing grounds up in the, the Grand Banks, just south of, of New England, and uh, yeah, in Newfoundland, and uh, the weather warnings get back, uh, get, get, get bad. Um, he doesn't get much in the way of fish. Uh, the warnings get worse and says, no, I'm going to get some fish. So he ends, heads out even further to the Flemish <coughs> Cap there. And uh, to, to cut a long story short, the, the weather gets worse and wor worse. He, he uh, ignores all these warnings. Um, I, won't, um, I won't tell you the full story, just in case any of you haven't seen the film, so I won't spoil it for you. But, uh, it's all about the weather and, and how we get to the perfect storm because essentially three major weather fronts develop while he's out there and you can see these, these anticyclones, these major depressions forming and uh, in the middle of it they form the perfect storm, 100 foot tall waves etc etc. Um, so this is just in my mind sprung off the analogy with uh, what's happening in the farm industry in recent years and uh, the, the three major depressions of weather fronts the, that have hit the farm industry have been uh, patent expiries, uh, regulatory hurdles, and pricing and reimbursement. And together, they really have created a perfect storm for the farm industry, and one I think we're all suffering from. Um, you know, let's run through these briefly. You know, the, the, the patent cliff is fairly well documented, and you know, if we look at uh, products that come off the patent last year, and, and uh, on the right hand column, what their 2010 sales were. Uh, the best known of these, I guess, is Lipitor, uh, over 5 billion in 2010 sales, even greater in 2011, uh, uh, what Joel Pfizer's uh, income. Uh, then if we look at uh, products going off patent this year, and, and again, the 2010 sales, even, even bigger numbers here, including, sadly, uh, AstraZeneca, Seroquel. So a huge amount of revenue to our, our big pharma companies. And, and the issue is, these revenues aren't being replaced. Um, now, clearly we're trying to replace them, but there are uh, ever increasing regula regulatory hurdles to get over. Um, th this graph shows the uh, fairly, fairly poor clinical success rates we, 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 we achieve in the farm industry. Now, the, the bar chart is showing the percentages of getting, uh, this is for both non-oncology and oncology drugs, getting from one phase of clinical development to, to the next. So, you can see the 65% from phase one to phase two and so on. And then the, the numbers at the bottom show those <coughs> aggregated percentages in getting from phase one to FDA approval over a seven year period. And, and these really are scary numbers, you know, 6.7% 6, 6. for oncology drugs and not a lot better for other indications. That really is scary and, and I think uh, we already had this, heard this morning about um, how, how the industry has got to do better. So, you know, okay, you might be one of those, uh, those guys who were the, the one in 15 with your oncology product and, and got through to, to registration, you, think you were home and dry. Oh, no, you're not. Um, you then got to, through your health technology assessment. Are you going to get reimbursement? Um, and, and here again, some numbers for cardiovascular and, and cancer drugs. And uh, the, these columns show where there have been positive reimbursement decisions from a, at least from a host of health technology assessment agencies, including NICE. Um, the, uh, an unfortunately low percentage of, of recommend decisions, a fairly high percentage of uh, amended recommendation decisions or, or limited decisions, and quite a high percentage for um, no, you're not getting reimbursement. And, and these are old numbers, these are 2008, and it has got significantly worse since. Um, so, you know, am I scaremongering? You know, is this really going to hit the industry? Well, absolutely it is. 
these are uh, 2011 uh, annual results from, from my company, AstraZeneca. And I look at the numbers on the right hand side, negative growth. Now, I've been at AstraZeneca since it was AstraZeneca. I was at Zeneca from when it was Zeneca. I've never seen results as bad as this. And this is absolutely not um, unique to AstraZeneca. This hits all major pharma companies, uh, negative growth. It wasn't many years ago when you know, we were talking about double digit growth for all companies. You know, those days are, are long gone. And uh, so you know, we, we see the problem here. Fewer successful product launches, uh, negative growth, and as we heard this morning, folks are questioning the sustainability of the pharma operating model. So, you know, what is pharma's response? Um, so, you know, clearly we're not growing the top line. So what you've got to do is shrink the bottom line. So the response is cost constraints. And uh, you know, the layoffs in the industry are pretty well documented. And what all pharma companies are doing is diverting all the resources, all our, all our dollars and their manpower to try and fill and progress the late stage pipeline. So where this has been getting to me is, you know, what happens to drug discovery, innovative drug discovery, which really is fundamental for the long-term future of the industry. Um, it really is not uh, receiving the funding and attention that it deserves within the industry because we've got to look after the short-term future, otherwise there won't be a long-term future. So what do we do about it? What is, uh, this is Farmer's Challenge. How to secure long-term sustainability through innovative drug discovery? Well, fortunately, there are a few geniuses around, like Liz Bright, Spark, the answer, creative collaboration. It probably doesn't take a rocket scientist to come up with that. I mean, collaboration has been fundamental to the industry for a, a long time, but I think what has been changing and what needs to change is, is that collaboration model. So in the days when your know, farmer was, was awash with money, um, you know, it would fully fund its collaborations. Uh, you know, it'd pay out you know, excessive amounts of well, some would say excess amounts of money. Um, but in return, it would retain all rights and get full commercial benefit from, from having paid. Um, I think the models now are very, very different. Um, you know, we more and more are asking our academic partners to, to share resources, share the costs, and uh, unfortunately have to give up the reward. But that, that's fine, that's a trade we have to make. So we, we like to reward our, our partners on achieving success, not, not for just having done the work. And, and clearly, if, if you know, there are other benefits there to the partner as well as increased reward, and there will be rights to, to compound to products if we don't prosecute them. Uh, and also, we'll throw in other things to collaborations, such as our uh, you know, uh, unique compound collections, which a number of academic partners found uh, uh, hugely valuable. So I'd just briefly like to take you through two uh, collaborations that we've done in AstraZeneca, which I think are reasonably <coughs> um, uh, innovative and hopefully is a way uh, to go for the future. So the first of these was uh, an oncology-focused collaboration between ourselves and Cancer Research Technology Discovery Labs. Um, this is a three-year collaboration where hopefully we, we find new targets from within Cancer Research UK's uh, academic community. These are brought in uh, and uh, once we agree on those targets with CRT, we jointly work on the drug discovery uh, process and it is very much joint. We've got 50, 50 resources and, and there are about 30 FTEs in total aligned to this. And once we reach that point part of the way through um, uh, lead optimization, um, AstraZeneca will, will bring these drug uh, programs back in house. And uh, you know the, the financial structure there is okay there was an access fee and recognition for what um, CRT will bring into the party but thereafter it is very much uh, funding each other's efforts we cover our own costs and then there are milestones back to CRT uh, when we start a project at, at screen uh, start um, when that uh, project gets brought into AstraZeneca and then these are the milestones through uh, clinical development and finally our, our royalty on sales so I think a fairly creative model that you know, we've been very happy with in AstraZeneca. Um, a, a second uh, collaboration uh, that AstraZeneca did, and this is uh, across their various, this is uh, with MRC technology. And here, again, it very much joined. Um, you know, MRC and AstraZeneca think about targets, generally targets where MRC has some expertise. They agree on which one should be brought into the collaboration. 
but the, you know, I guess the big uh, differentiating feature here is that AstraZeneca then provides a significant uh, compound collection contribution to, to this uh, collaboration. So MRC, they do the screening, they, they come up with the hits, and uh, what AstraZeneca gets is the option at two points in the future to buy into what uh, MRC have come up with. And that can have the hit stage. If AstraZeneca declines that, MRC carry on, and then we get a second option at the lead stage. Uh, so we bring these, uh, these compounds in and, and run drug discovery thereafter. And uh, if we decide not to take it forward, all those assets, they go back to MRC. So hopefully that's, that's a bit of a win-win. So just have a couple, a couple of examples there. I'm sure there are many more, but you know, I really do see this as the future for the industry, collaborating with you know, the, the quality science in academia, uh, but doing it on a, a risk-shared basis. And um, you know, for the, the future, you know, the, the problems that face in the industry aren't going away anytime soon, but you know, if you forgive me stretching the analogy just a little bit further, if uh, you know, pharma and uh, academia together, yeah, okay, <laughs> can work together. They'll they'll ride this this storm out, and uh, hopefully, uh, drugs, you know, innovative drug discovery will be sustained for the future. So, with that, I'll say, um, I can take any any questions. Ah, uh, you know, my plan didn't work. Sorry, Dan, I can't ask. No. One of the few common terms maybe it's too early to comment, but what sort of throughput would you expect from that collaboration with the, you know, the numbers coming out for options? Yeah, well, I can probably talk best to, to the CRT one, and um, we estimated that we'd get something. That CRT uh, collaboration runs by projects, steady state, and so there is attrition, but we estimate that we would get one what we call a CSID com, so, so something that's um, almost ready for clinical development, barring doing your, your 28 day talks. So something just just short of that stage, we then just get one of those out from running five projects. So you know that's still to be proven, but I'll get there. And I'll just still in the early stages. Um, you you concentrated on academia and um, pharma. What about CROs? Where do CROs fit into this? Because they've obviously got a place to play as yeah. well. No, absolutely. And CROs are, in fact, a fundal, fundamental part of the, the future for, for pharma. I mean, that's the other element I didn't cover, but more and more work is going to, to CROs. But I guess it comes at a cost. So working with CROs has the advantage <coughs> of fewer um, you know, fixed costs within the industry. So we certainly are using CROs. So it was more and more, rather than retaining our own people, our own buildings, our own infrastructure. So we are going that way. Um, maybe they work a little bit uh, less well in terms of the, the shared risk. But you know, I've known CROs change their business model and take reduced FE rates for, for milestones, and you know, we very much welcome that. So. Okay, so I'll finish there, and I'll pass over to Paul McBaron from Cyber <coughs> to close the session. <coughs>